Good morning. Um, welcome uh, to Barcelona, for, to who is not from here. And um, welcome to our session, uh, Phasing Over Tourism, uh, Challenge um, to Sustainability, Tourist Experience and Local Communities. Um, today we will have one hour and a half. We will share um, experiences, knowledges with our speakers. We have five speakers. Uh, we are really honored to have here. Um, Ms. Maria Gravari uh, Barbas, Director of the Interdisciplinary Research Team on Tourism from the University Pantheon Sorbonne. Uh, Sergi Maripons, Manager of Tourism, Commerce and Markets at Barcelona City Council. Uh, Ms. Alicia Gomez Tatay, uh, Promotion Executive of Valencia uh, Region Tourism Board. Uh, Ms. Jelka Tepsic, uh, Deputy Mayor, City of Dubrovnik. And Ms. Leticia Ortega uh, from Valencian uh, Regional Government, Ministry of Housing, Public Works, and Territory Structure. So, why a panel on over tourism? Why over tourism has been um, entered, entered in our life in the tourism sector from a public perspective from, uh, to academia as, uh, as, of course, a buzzword? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it seems that uh, since the um, tourism magazine Skift uh, started to use this word, um, we are actually experiencing a kind of uh, Cartesian dualism. Hmm? Is actually over tourism a, a, a serious thing? Or is it just you know, like a kind of uh, a product of media sensationalism? Um, of course, tourism is a, a continuum, transforming phenomenon. Uh, the tourism sector can translate every kind of trend in social life, in economic life, uh, in a tourism product. Um, in the 80s, when we start to talk about sustainability, uh, the tourism st st sector start to talk about responsible tourism. Uh, when we start to talk about um, uh, the problem in international cooperation in the, in, at, the, at the end of the 90s, we start with voluntary tourism, with pro poor tourism. So every time there is a, a new trend in social, economic, political um, uh, um, sphere uh, dimension, we come out with the product. Right now, of course, uh, over tourism, we cannot consider anymore as, as a buzzword. Um, and uh, when I was doing a research on this topic, um, um, I, was, I, I went through some data of the World Bank and World Tourism Organization. And um, I went through a, a, a data that actually impressed me a lot. From the 50 to the 1950 to the two, uh, 2017, the world population uh, registered a growth of more or less 148%. The tourist arrival uh, from the 1960 to the 2017 registered um, a growth of more than 5,190%. So, of course, when we, have, when we are facing this uh, dualism of is over tourism a serious issue? Of course, what we, we, we register worldwide, and not just in the Mediterranean region, uh, it's an incredible uh, growth uh, in terms of tourist arrival. And of course, now we have a renewed on the relation of tourism and development. While we are talking about tourism as a, as a, as a um, negative issue, if we were euphoric, here in Barcelona during the Olympic Games. So while we are talking, for example, about over tourism here, but then we have a lot of other country, a lot of other region, also in the Mediterranean uh, area, that, that are registering a kind of under tourism situation or under tourism context. Of course, there are, there are different perspectives that can help us to understand why over tourism um, matter and actually is, um, 
is the latest frontier of the tourism phenomenon. Everything starts, of course, from a urban perspective. But it's not just from, from, uh, from a urban perspective that we can analyze, um, analyze uh, over tourism. If we are doing a parallelism with the rural, uh, with, uh, with the rural life, in other sectors like fishing, we do use the suffix over. We, we do use overfishing. So why not using over tourism when we are over exploiting resources? But on one end, of course, everything starts when, uh, and uh, this kind of, of, uh, um, of hysteria of talking about over tourism from a urban perspective. And uh, we like it or not, our economic system since the Hades and what has, has been called the neoliberal turn, of course, uh, is, is a um, no return point. And uh, cities, since the Hades, start to get into a new phenomenon, what we have called urban, urban tourism, or the city break. It's not a case that in Barcelona or city like Mallorca, uh, Lisbon and the, south, the southern Europe, um, now we have a lot of social movement or grassroots organization talking about over tourism and the right uh, of the city. So of course, since the Hades, there was a shift, a paradigm shift. We had cities that live with tourism to tourist cities. It's not a case that the Barcelona uh, strategy plan of tourism start saying and stating that Barcelona is a tourist city. But then tourism is not the only, uh, and the only force, an agent. In the, um, I have this column here, and let's see if we can... It will be a challenge for us to talk with this column down there. But uh, of course, there is another issue that is what has been called also the mobility turn. What is the mobility turn? During the 90s, of course, in this paradigm shift of our economic system, uh, we start to destructure those kind of dualism like home, work, tradition. Uh, uh, ordinary and extraordinary home and travel. And what we have seen in the last decades, that tourism and tourists, they are not the only force in a city or in a, at urban level or at a rural level. We have new kind of identities and mobilities. We have nomad, digital nomadism. We have uh, international students. The phenomenon of a studentification, of course, is shaping our city, as well as tourism is shaping our city. Um, and uh, yesterday we were talking about the Erasmus project. Erasmus project has been also a vector of shaping our Mediterranean and European, uh, 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 European region. And we have another phenomenon also that we can call the temporary residence. Temporary residence as students, as uh, the new creative class, of course is shaping our, our city as well as tourism is doing. Then we have another phenomenon that probably helps a lot to talk about over tourism at the European level, but also worldwide. That is what I have called the touristification of social movement or the specialization of, of social movement. Social movements, since the, the, um, um, the labor social movement that we can know, they were, they were um, uh, fighting for other kind of rights, like um, um, gender equality, uh, privatization of, of, uh, of the education, um, 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 health care, but now what we have seen in the last decades that a lot of grassroots organization and social movement, they start to put tourism in their agenda. It is not the case that from the Southern Europe, there is actually a movement called the SET, Southern European uh, Movement Against Touristification that is really powerful in Italy and Spain. But also we have in Malta, in Portugal, and, uh, and a bit in, in France. So of course there is also this phenomenon, how how tourism and over-tourism enter in the, in, in the social mo movement agenda that helps another perspective, the media sensationalism. 
before the 2017, the Guardian, the New, New York Times, El País here in Spain, and all the international press, they were not really interested in tourism or in over-tourism. But of course now is an issue. But what we have learned so far, of course there is no one solution that can fit all. There is no, no one solution, and actually tourism and over-tourism is not just a tourism-related issue. It's an urban issue. And this is an issue that we should face, and here we have a lot of speakers come from, from uh, regional and city and city governmental institutions. We need to face new mobilities in our city, and tourism is just one of, uh, of those. And then, of course, over tourism, as that's why I show you also those data, is showing us also the limits of growth. Cities are, um, there was a, a geographer in the 70s uh, saying that cities are a growth machine, and of course are a growth machine. And tourism is part of that, but it's not the only one, it's the only, the, the only force. And of course, we have finite resources. Now we are facing with the Greta effects. Hmm? Uh, someone that from, from the new generation that's saying, let's, let's rethink and let's have a paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift is also in the way of how we measure tourism. We have measured tourism since the 60s just in order of tourist arrival and, and, and incomes. We need other criteria. We need other way to measure the success of tourism. Um, that's why today we will have uh, uh, um, a great session with our our uh, our speakers, and uh, we will after open the debate, open the floor. Uh, we will have our hub also uh, to have a kind of interaction. Um, we will start with uh, Sergi. Uh, I sorry with Maria Gravari uh, Barbas, Barbas, and um, she will talk about how academia, and she will introduce us uh, over tourism from an academic per perspective, and how academia can contribute uh, to analyze over tourism. Thank you, and thank you so much. Does it work? Okay. Thank you so much, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation, and thank you for this great introduction. Overtourism is a very uh, controversial, as it was said, a very controversial and a very multidimensional phenomenon. It receives increasing attention in academic, political, and also online media debates. However, there is no any academic definition of overtourism. The term is used to describe the presence of an excessive number of visitors to a particular destination. It designates uh, a situation in which a popular destination uh, or site becoming overrun with tourists in an unsustainable uh, way. But this is obviously not a scientific definition. Overtourism is not a recent phenomenon. But it has recently attracted a lot of attention, in particular due to the sharp increase of local residents' uh, protests against tourism in several European destinations. It has become a political issue in some cities where uh, it was often highlighted during recent local election campaigns, and of course Barcelona is the best example for this. The Telegraph proclaimed over tourism World of the Year 2017. And it is clear that open tourism is uh, essentially um, a media-created uh, term which uh, came into wider usage during the summer 2017, along with the term of tourismophobia or touristophobia. Uh, the, and I put here some images from Barcelona, which express, I think, pretty well this touristo or tourismophobia. The mediating nature of overtourism is visible through the analysis of Google Trends. Oops. It shows uh, a very steep increase of searches over the last two years and witnesses on the online media's growing interest for this issue. 
The geographical distribution of searches also is interesting because it shows that six out of the 10 uh, ranked countries for the number of searches are in European countries, half of them in Mediterranean uh, area. In a recent study uh, conducted uh, for the European uh, Parliament and on the basis of a qualitative analysis uh, involving 80 stakeholders in 13 uh, European cities, Corns, Potsma and RAP identified uh, five main characteristics for uh, overtourism. The uh, overcrowding in cities' public space, the pervasiveness of visitor impact due to uh, inappropriate behavior, uh, physical touristification of city centers and other uh, highly visited uh, areas, displaced residents in residential areas due to Airbnb and similar platforms, and pressure on uh, local environment. However, for the moment, there are no common criteria or indicators able to offer, for example, comparative uh, or comparable uh, numbers of visitors or even ratios of visitors inhabitants to formally define this concept of over-tourism. So the term is highly subjective, depending on who is speaking, local residents, hosts, business owners, tourists themselves, the discourse obviously is not the same. It can be understood, for example, as a global reaction to, uh, of local inhabitants to the phenomenon of displacement of local populations due to the increase of rents, as a reaction of local inhabitants or decision makers to traffic, to pollution, to also endangered uh, environment, or, or as a reaction of uh, local stakeholders, inhabitants and decision makers to the deterioration of heritage be it uh, cultural or natural. In general, we could say that alienated local residents, uh, degraded tourist experience, overloaded infrastructure, damage to nature, threats to culture and heritage are the main symptoms, we could say, uh, most often used to explain what over-tourism is. Uh, what are the factors uh, producing over-tourism? Uh, the fact remains that over-tourism is caused by a cumulative and I would, lay, I would say rather complex range of factors, resulting in a similarly complex chain of impacts and challenges for local populations, for authorities, for policy makers and for other stakeholders. First of all, and it was um, just said in introduction, the global increase of tourism. We cannot understand over tourism if we do not take into consideration the fact that we are speaking here about huger and huger numbers globally for tourism. The increase of the overall numbers of tourists is probably the major uh, cause of over tourism. Global tourism is on rise and growth faster uh, in tourism hotspots. Uh, an ever growing middle class in developing countries spends more and more of its disposable income on travel. Uh, according to Visa, uh, the, the um, uh, prospects for 2025 say that more than 20, um, 280 uh, million households will be traveling internationally each year. And you have in this um, uh, graph here the development of the, uh, the Chinese market alone, which in fact illustrates this. Between the beginning of the 21st century and 2018, the number of overseas trips made by Chinese residents grow from 10.5 million uh, visitors to 156 uh, million. And according to Kotri, uh, the China uh, Outbound Tourism Research Institute, Chinese overseas trips will increase to more than 400 million by 2030. Similar growth, uh, similar growth patterns uh, can be seen also for other markets such as the, uh, the Indian uh, market. And we know that visitors to Europe from these emerging uh, markets tend to focus their trips on short visits to the most famous and frequently already 
over touristified destinations. Uh, then, second factor, the development, uh, developments in travel and transportation options. Obviously, we cannot not speak here about the rise of collaborative platforms offering short-term accommodation, such as Airbnb, this is the most often uh, quoted, but also HomeAway and many, many others, which have been identified by researchers as a major disruption uh, in tourist sites, and in particular, again, in cities. In a very short time, thousands of beds have been uh, made available in already saturated districts without being subject to any kind of planning, a uh, permit, and until very, very recently, taxes. Uh, this rapid expansion of short-term rentals and their impacts on particular neighborhoods and socioeconomic groups and interests have become a very contentious issue uh, which has been very analyzed by uh, recent academic papers. There is a huge number uh, of academic papers for the last five years uh, uh, working on Airbnb, analyzing Airbnb. Uh, similarly, and this is my second uh, graph in this uh, slide, the availability of cheap flights has also contributed to European overtourism, as uh, studies have shown how they significantly uh, boost international arrivals to destinations newly served by low-cost uh, carriers. From 2007 to 2016, low-cost flights grew by 61% in Europe, uh, whereas traditional scheduled uh, flights were down by 10%. Also, cruise, oops, cruise development, this is uh, also a very uh, impacting uh, factor. We know that cruises also go uh, preferably to um, tourist hotspots. The evolution also of tourist behavior, um, which also contributed to over-tourism in several ways. There is strong evidence that the average length of stay, of stay has been declining in most countries. So uh, travelers travel for shorter times, shorter periods of, uh, of stay in, 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 in destinations, and in fact, they are more likely to uh, focus on the most important uh, attractions. On the same time, and this is a quite a paradox, tourists seek also a more authentic experience linked to local culture and lifestyle, as opposed to visiting only tourist hotspots. And in fact, by looking to live like a local, they uh, in fact impact much more uh, residential neighborhoods and create more over tourism uh, phenomena. Also, a new generation of tourists, because uh, a key driver of the evolution in tourist behavior is generational characteristics. Millennials, in particular, travel in significant numbers, use an important part of their earnings for traveling, and they travel differently than previous generations. They also are more likely than previous generations to use social media and technology and frequent, uh, they are frequent low-cost uh, users, and also frequent users of collab collaborative platforms. So there's a kind of cumulative effect uh, due to millennial. And I kept for the, uh, for the last, uh, the most important, in fact, factor, which is globally a very poor, a very poor governance and regulation. I think this is the most important point here, uh, the point that we should stress all of us together during this session, because obviously, this is the fact on which local governments can really intervene. Uh, there remains limited awareness among authorities and stakeholders of the risks and of the potential negative impacts of over-tourism, and this leads to poor planning and to very weak regulations. Where measures uh, have been taken by local authorities, they are mostly reactive rather than preventive or proactive. And till today, uh, in order to, success, uh, to measure a successful destination, we still use to measure numbers. And obviously, this is really a problem. We should find other indicators, new indicators, in order to see what is a, successive, a successful sorry, uh, destination. It's not only destination which attracts every year more and more uh, visitors. 
Um, the responses to over-tourism, if we uh, do a kind of overview of the literature, uh, and I'm speaking here about the papers which have been published in recent years, we do have all this range of local responses. I will not have the time to comment them because I see that you start making uh, some signs. Uh, but I just give it here, and what I try to do rather is to organize into a kind of classification all those very different and very disparate, in fact, uh, local responses to uh, over-tourism. If we try to uh, organize them better, we can uh, organize them out uh, in, in six, in fact, main, uh, main themes. Uh, diversification of tourist offer, information and communication tools, improved management of visitor flows, and this corresponds mainly to proactive, in fact, uh, measures, and also restriction of access, uh, control of accommodation, taxes, tolls, and price increase, which correspond rather to reactive uh, responses. And I will conclude uh, in my fourth point, which is the need to um, a kind of paradigm shift in terms of understanding and analyzing over tourism. Uh, several works have been done during the last years on the concept of carrying capacity, which is defined, as I put it um, here and according to uh, O'Reilly, as the maximum number of people that may visit a tourist destination at the same time without causing destruction of the physical, economic, sociocultural environment and an unacceptable uh, decrease in the quality of visitors. Carrying capacity is defined as a kind of load capacity uh, of tourism uh, destinations, and this depends mainly on the number of visitors and the environmental, economic, and social pressure they produce. Uh, however, um, in the more recent uh, tourism literature, uh, carrying capacity uh, has, has been used to refer both to the quantitative, in fact, limit of visitors in the destination and to the feeling that such limit has been, uh, in fact, overcome. However, and this is a very, very important point here, communities are not homogeneous entities. And it may be very misleading to draw conclusions from average views. And this is the problem of the media coverage of this over-tourism uh, issue because this tends to neglect the views of special groups. Furthermore, there is a very clear divide in most touristic destinations between those who suffer from, uh, from, suffer from um, um, tourism without receiving any benefit, uh, a professor, a postman, a municipal worker, and those who have invested millions in tourism operations and for who tourism growth is the most attractive option, of course. So in an attempt to overcome the limitations of a misleading objectivation of the carrying capacity, uh, we can introduce here the model of the limits of acceptable change. The limits of acceptable change, which seems to me a much more, in fact, appropriate way to uh, define all those uh, issues. In fact, the limits, the limits of acceptable change model shifted the analytical perspective to the process of an ex-ante definition of quality standards, which is based on value judgments. So this is very important to say from the beginning that when we speak about over-tourism, we speak a lot and we speak mainly about value judgments. Uh, the analytical perspective consequently shifts to the process of a collective definition of tolerance degree a collective definition of a tolerance degree according to which tourism burdens are uh, bearable. And I will uh, conclude here, I'm very sorry to be, uh, to be very, very long, but this is a quite complex uh, issue, and the analysis of recent uh, bibliography by the academia shows how interesting this issue is for, uh, for my colleagues. Uh, what I would like to say here is that, after all, let's take it positively. I think that we are living here for uh, researchers on tourism formidable times. Maybe for the very first time in the tourism history and the tourism academic history, it starts to be clearly understood from everybody and for everybody 
that tourism is not just a kind of physical phenomenon. Eh? It's not just like rain that comes from the sky. And that tourism destinations are not only supposed just to collect all tourism at any time and uh, at any cost. It becomes clear for all that it's a social and an economic activity which needs to be uh, monitored, planned, and organized. Go governance here is really the key word. Thank you. On how policymakers can help to uh, cope over tourism um, without affecting economic growth. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here among you. And, um, and uh, on behalf of the Council of Tourism of Barcelona, Agustí Colom, uh, I give you the, his congratulations for this uh, debate, uh, so well organized. And I'm, very, and I'm glad especially about the approach that the moder our moderator gave to the session in, in, in uh, his uh, first speech. Can I move, like you? Okay. okay, thank you. Can I move around the room? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. But maybe technolo technically I can. No? So, well, uh, I think uh, I, I will try to react some about some uh, co questions or some problems that you have put on the debate, uh, speaking about the case of Barcelona, what I think is uh, what I have to do. Um, and first, I think the, the over-tourism in Barcelona is the result of the success of Barcelona as a touristic destination. And uh, private uh, and public sector cooperation was one of the uh, pillars of this success. In fact, after the Olympic Games in 1992, uh, our touristic promotion was uh, uh, organized as a PPP scheme, as a private-public partnership. And that was uh, very good in the sense that uh, from half, from the last decades, uh, half, uh, half a century, we think that tourism was only a good side a benefit side, a positive side for the economy. But tourism has externalities. All the economic activities has externalities. And we know that because our global economy has <laughs> externalities, no? climate change, etc. So I think we discover um, quite late uh, that tourism has the other side. And I think it was not the media which discover, who discovered that. In our case, was the population. And was the population with demonstrations and, 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 and complaints who asked us to react. And I agree that uh, administration, a public administration, is more reactive than, than preventive in, the, in this moment, but this reaction is necessary. Uh, in the case of Barcelona, uh, our uh, reaction take uh, uh, a model based on different things. First is the idea of limit, and, and uh, the uh, actual touristic policy in Barcelona uh, has a plan, has two important plans. First is an urban plan uh, tra trying to uh, establish a global limit and trying to spread the, alloca the, the allocation uh, in the city. So uh, avoid the concentration in the center. That is that not easy. But with this tool, an urban plan, we use the concept of limit. And I think this concept is very important for our topic. Uh, second plan is a strategic, a tourism strategy, a strategy, a tourism strategy. Because to put limits, and to try to manage these over tourists is not only a, go a goal uh, l looking as a solution, looking for a, for a solution in uh, um, city problems. Uh, for example, uh, crowding, crowded uh, public spaces or uh, housing, very important housing problem, gentrification, etc. 
but we need this uh, policy and these limits also in benefit of tourism himself, itself. Uh, and the quality of the visit experience is something very important in a strategy, in a, in a strategy, in a competitive strategy, in the classical sense, Michael Porter, you know, have a, a product. But my reflection is, what is this product in the global market of tourism? Uh, and in urban tourism, especially in urban tourism, our product, uh, what we sell in the global market, is the city, is the full city. And, and if we consider that the market is global and the product is the, the full city, it is important to uh, think about that as a basket, as a basket full of things, full of private goods, and private services, but also with full of public goods, and public services, and even full of other things that neither public and private sector supply as the horizon, the sea, and the beach, and the natural things, and things that population supply, no? Com, uh, liability of the city, uh, values, uh, authentici uh, authenticity of the experience. Tourists want to be in a real city, and this city is what we sell. So, how manage this basket in private-public cooperation? We have a new situation. Uh, the, the, you, 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 you comment about overfishing. Overfishing is a, is a classical example learned in the universities uh, of environmental economy. And uh, what uh, the economist advise in overfishing is always advice to, to the, to the uh, fishermen, uh, when they are a lot of fishermen in, a, in a, uh, exploiting a, a resource, act as they, uh, they um, be one fisher uh, company. Only one, act cooperation, cooperating, acting as uh, that uh, resource was uh, for exploited, but only one. So that means cooperation and leadership. And this uh, cooperation needs a new lead, lead, leadership. And that uh, we try to, to organize in, in Barcelona, I think is the most strategic uh, bill, most, most most strategic challenge of our policy is put together the different sectors that offer, that, that, that made this basket, in uh, and trying to uh, cooperate not only private and public sector, also with citizens and with the spirit of the city, with academic points of view, and in this uh, uh, Council of uh, uh, City Tourism, new Council of City Tourism, we, uh, we, are, uh, we, we are having an experience, not so easy, uh, putting together so many different interests. And, and uh, f uh, from these uh, three years, uh, the problem was uh, big, very big. At the first moment, businessmen say, what neighbors, why neighbors speak about tourists? They don't know, they, they, they know anything about our business. And citizens uh, answer, you are only seeing your business, your benefits, and not the, uh, the long-term uh, needs of the city and of the sector. This dialogue was difficult, but after three years, the result of all these sectors that, that in this council try to dialogue, try to understand each other, uh, say that they are satisfied. And they ask, follow this tool and follow this uh, council, this, this uh, possibility of dialogue, of, of, of building consensus. And uh, all this process needs uh, this uh, new 
approach of leadership, and uh, I think public sector, in, this, in the case, in our case, the city council, is the responsible, is, it has the, the, the duty to leadership this uh, new approach of public, private, and citizen partnership to, uh, to, to protect the, the quality of our destinations, of, of our product in the global market. Uh, maybe uh, uh, the, the point uh, that can resume all of that is pass from the right to the visit uh, to the visit to the right to the city, and trying to put together uh, locals and visitors in a concept as a citizen, uh, or and uh, consider permanent citizens and temporary citizens, uh, people uh, which, uh, who has together the right to uh, enjoy, to, to be satisfied of the everyday life and of the visit together in a city uh, which have to be real and not only at service of the, of the visitors. So, that means our marketing and our promotion have to change radically. So not at service of demand, not at service of the visitor want, of the big company that organize the visitor want, at service, at service of this basket, at service of the supply that the city want to be, so what the city want to offer to the visitor and to the world. I mean, this is a reflection about the case of Barcelona that could be I hope could be useful in our debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we will have uh, Miss Jelka Tepsic. Um, she will um, talk about how a city council uh, needs to tackle over tourism. Uh, she will put a focus on a project called Respect the City. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, dear all, I'm very happy to be here with you today and thank you for the organizers to inviting us to give us the possibility to share with you uh, our experiences and of course to share our uh, main goals of our project Respect the City, which uh, uh, I have to give you a short introduction of the project uh, because First of all, I have to stress that we are reacting since we are the local government who took the responsibility of, for the city, for the governance of the city back in 2017, just two years ago. So what we faced was the biggest uh, challenge uh, and the media coverage is saying that Dubrovnik is dying actually because of over-tourism, overcrowdedness, too many people, too many cruise ships. And first we did was uh, to communicate, to start the communication with the biggest association of cruise companies, which is called CLIA, and to start to negotiate with them uh, about our future partnership, which we did so far very successfully, and we are cooperating on a daily basis. But Respect the City is much more than that. It's an umbrella project with three group of goals. Uh, they are divided in uh, short-term goals, which are mostly active and um, agile measures. Then the like mid-term goals, which are dealing with uh, some uh, plans for future period, which is already 219, and the long-term goals, which are uh, dealing with infrastructural plans, uh, urban reconstructions, and which are not made for uh, because of the political reasons, but on the contrary, we did some radical measures which are not guaranteeing any political success in our future uh, elections. So I wanted to stress that because I think it's important we don't calculate on our uh, on number of votes for the future. Uh, so, I told that uh, first of all we started with some uh, very, 
very agile measures, but uh, our goals were divided in four pillars, which are uh, smart and sustainable transport solutions. Uh, for those who don't know, Dubrovnik is the most uh, southern Croatian city. Uh, it's uh, located in a very narrow terrain, and we have very it has very narrow roads. It has 42,000 inhabitants and 35,000 registered cars, 15,000 registered motorcycles. So maybe for you it doesn't sound too many, but believe me, in uh, our narrow streets, it's a really big traffic uh, crowds and jams on a daily basis. So uh, our second pillar is, uh, of course, sustainable and balanced local development, innovative destination management, and human resources development. Uh, speaking about uh, destination management, it's, of course, important to stress that our project, Respect the City, has a, a counseling board, consists of about 50 persons, and uh, when we started to uh, create the project, uh, then we presented all our goals and main uh, main issues to that uh, counseling board and of course received the, uh, their response. Uh, what is also important regarding the destination management, back in 2018, a year ago, we um, adopted on the city council the strategy of tourism development with a main focus on cruise tourism, uh, which is uh, up from the period, uh, I mean, two 2025, and the next step in that is an action plan, which is actually the project Respect the City, which we are preparing now and uh, hoping to be adopted uh, or in July, but most, we believe, uh, in September on our city council. So through that action plan, we, we are giving uh, all detailed, not instructions, but directions uh, for a future management of the destination. Uh, speaking about smart solutions, uh, about a new uh, way of uh, experiencing the destination, I have also to uh, stress that the project Respect the City is not only addressed uh, to solving uh, over-tourism problems, but for us the main importance uh, is to improve the quality of a visitor's stays and experience in the destination, but on the other hand, which is as important as the first one, is to improve the quality of life of, of our inhabitants. When we are, uh, when we saw all those um, descriptions of what over tourism is, then uh, it happens in Dubrovnik. But with some smart solutions, which are both addressed to visitors and to inhabitants, we are trying to make dispersion of tourists, a tourist visit, and also to uh, resolve some of uh, the problems, such as the parking. Dubrovnik has very limited number of parkings, but nowadays we are starting with a very, very um, innovative uh, application, which is smart parking, some information says that it's very unique even in the world, so all around the city, not only around the, the old uh, the old city, which is the main Dubrovnik attractions, you will have uh, sensors and uh, light, li lights or, or screens with information about uh, your, uh, about free parking lots with the application, of course, so w one who is starting from their home and trying to find uh, the some parking lot, we will have immediate uh, information on their cell phone. Uh, another, another important uh, tool for us, I think it's on our next slide. No, it's not. I'm sorry, I have to go back. Uh, which we started last year. It's the, sorry. Here it is. It's the prediction of number of tourists. Uh, who are going to be in a certain period in, a, in the old zone of Dubrovnik. It's called DubrovnikVisitor.hr. Uh, it involves six cameras, which are counting number of people entering and uh, going out of the city, uh, but it has also a graphic uh, a graphic part of it, uh, so when you click on the date on the calendar, uh, by the color on that uh, graphics, you can uh, realize, uh, realize how many people is going to be on that day in the old zone of Dubrovnik. So green defines there are no too many people, yellow is more people, and of course red is the top number of people. We believe that by using this um, 
tool uh, our future visitors can better plan their stay in the destination. So uh, regarding to uh, people counters, as we call those cameras around, uh, I have to uh, explain how what we did with the cruise ships. Uh, in our first negotiations, we start to uh, deal with uh, cruise companies and starting to uh, work on a better organization of cruise ship calls because you know that uh, the perception is always that cruise industry is making the biggest over tourism issue all around the Mediterranean. Dubrovnik is one of the most known Mediterranean ports of call, and uh, we have per year about 800,000 visitors on cruise ships with all our uh, uh, tourists spending their holidays in Dubrovnik and one day the, the visitors, the number of visitors per year is more than three millions. So uh, for our small city is a very uh, big number. So we uh, decided to limit the number of cruise passengers uh, per day. That means 8,000 in one day or divided in two parts of the day. We allow only two ships per morning, two ships per afternoon, meaning 4,000 people on cruise ships visiting per morning or per afternoon. And uh, beside that, we did a better organization of uh, arrivals and departures and of, of course disembarking uh, visitors. So we have uh, the coordination uh, body who is controlling uh, how many buses at the same time are leaving the port, how many buses are arriving at uh, the main spot where all the, uh, the operation of uh, entering the old zone is uh, happening, which is a pillar gate. Also, we cut 30% of rental spaces for uh, our restaurants and coffee shops within the walls and 80% of stands uh, for bookings and uh, and all kinds of other services which uh, used to uh, be around the old zone. So we are working on the mobility within that uh, pedestrian zone of the old city. So Dubrovnik is UNESCO heritage site since 40 years ago. We were uh, listed in back in 1979 and uh, one of the uh, reasons why we actually as a local government started to immediately to deal with those problems is a uh, recommendation from the ICOMOS UNESCO Commission uh, who visited Dubrovnik back in 2015 and uh, they gave some instructions how to preserve outstanding universal value of our city which is the main uh, actually reason why one city is a world heritage city. Uh, so, speaking about mid- and long-term measures, uh, we are now in that mid-term period of our uh, Respect the City project and we are working on a sustainable urban mobility plan and the urban development uh, studies, uh, also a new transportation solu transport solution such as electric boat tram and integrated transport solutions, sustainable tourism development projects, uh, throughout the education and marketing, of course, because we are having all co communication tools for our Respect the City project, and it's, we are concentrating now on uh, promoting it. And smart destination mobility and visitor management integrated solutions. Actually, the, the application was developed, and uh, probably very soon we are going to present it together with our partners. And long-term pro projects uh, are concentrating on new urban development and uh, city and mobility centers uh, in seafront of Gruge, which is actually next to, the, our, to our harbor. Uh, new, building new attractions and preparing projects for new attractions, uh, like the Dubrovnik Summer Residences, which is located in the zone of uh, the river of Dubrovnik. And it, it's a series of some residences from the Dubrovnik Republic period, park and ride system, park and sale system, and public uh, parking garages, and of course, new roads and a tunnel and new entrances uh, to the city. So actually, it's, it's a very demanding, but we are, believe me, we are working on a daily basis on different solutions. Uh, what we are facing also is everyday new challenges and uh, a kind of um, impatience of inhabitants who really want to 
things to change very quickly, which is unfortunately not possible. So we believe that over-tourism can be avoided by proper management, by proactive approach, not reaction, but I have to uh, say it again, we are reacting fortunately because we inherited the rough commercialization period and no destination management at all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Ms. Tapsic, and uh, now uh, Ms. Alicia Gomez Tatay will present on how promotion and destination marketing should accomplish to face over tourism. She will present that she will put the focus on the Harry Data project. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'm just trying, going to try to show you a little bit about a new project that is called Edit Data, and the name comes from Heritage and Data, so it's quite easy to remember for future events. Uh, first of all, before I start, I would like to talk about two recent studies that have, have been used in our, in our project to make a state of art. So where are we at the moment, at the present moment, in, in, um, in tourism? As my colleagues explained, over tourism is a quite new term that is being used. And now we have lots of inputs about what's going on, what's over tourism, what can we do from um, governments and institutions. And these two documents are quite new. They were released in 2018 at the end. And over tourism, understanding and managing urban tourism growth period perceptions, finalized with 11 strategies. Uh, to mitigate negative effects of mass tourism in destinations. And ERIT data is focused in one of these uh, strategies, in the last one, which is establishment, monitoring, and action measures by using data, or big data. And the other document is uh, over tourism impact and possible, possible policies responses, because this is really where the most challenge um, the challenge is for us to manage tourism. Um, I'm just going to show you a few pictures that you are probably quite familiar with, with the city of Dubrovnik, um, the arrival of cruisers, uh, population with Venice, uh, selling this kind of you know, image of a nice destination with no public at all, but reality is completely different. Lots of mass uh, people in the streets, also Amsterdam, which is not in the Mediterranean, but also has suffered from over tourism over the last two, three years. Um, and something quite interesting, I, um, I Amsterdam was one of the main promotional items and publicities of the city a few years ago, but it became completely um, negative, it had a negative impact in the city because all tourists used to go to that place and make the photo. That's how social media has affected tourism. And finally, Amsterdam Council Town decided to remove that slogan from there and to try not to have too many people at the entrance of the museum. And finally, Barcelona, um, one of the most important cities of the Mediterranean, has suffered from mass tourism over the last years. So I want to talk about this and just um, show you very briefly, what's happened um, in, the last, in the last years to come. But first of all, talking about a global vision of tourism, um, the European Union is leading tourism destination uh, in the world with 562 million international arrivals. As my colleague said before, the data is only about arrivals and uh, people coming to a destination, and that has to be changed. Tourism has an econo impact, uh, economic impact in destination, but also, as we have seen, it has negative impacts, and that's what we would like to change. Edit data is going to be focused on how to manage uh, heritage destinations, trying to reduce the impact of tourism by the use of technologies. And at the end of the project, which takes four years, we will be able, the partners, to come with ideas, applications, and maybe best practices. 
the project is going to have uh, three modules and it will have uh, five pilots in Croatia, France, Greece, Italy and Spain. And it's going to be focused on cities but also um, heritage areas in Greece and France. It's a four years project, as I said, and there are three models. So now we are at the very beginning because the project only started in April um, 2018. And we have been finalizing the an study. The next step is testing and transferring knowledge and a final capitalization period. So you have more information about every data, but from now on, you will probably be become more familiar with this project. So, just a short introduction about what's happened in the past years in tourism. These are, this is a very nice video about how tourism was at the beginning, at the end of the 70s, 80s, when we start to have the possibility to go to other places, experience other realities, meet other people, and discover new places. How has that changed? It's been very, very quick. They are basically three elements that have made the change. The first revolution was, was with low-cost airlines. It was cheaper to go abroad than stay at the place, go for dinner, etc. cetera. Uh, second revolution was the use of um, ex possibilities to go and stay in other places. Well, sorry, video is off. It was a very one minute video. But basically what I wanted to show you is that the idea of tourism has changed in the past years. And as we saw in, in the year um, 12, uh, 2017, everything changed and all media started to say over tourism, something is happening. Residents are not happy anymore with what's going on because negative impacts were um, too big. Here we have uh, a state of art, so it's been quite recent that different destinations all over Europe and also in all over the world, they have taken into account that the residents were not happy with what was going on with the tourism, so they took the first active actions, like Barcelona in January 2017 creates new regulation to control over tourism, few months later, in June, Venice plans to ban the construction of new hotels. Dubrovnik, in August, announces a plan to drastically reduce the number of visitors, as my colleague just explained. Also, Amsterdam, in order to avoid mass tourism, uh, prohibits shops, souvenir shops in the central area of Amsterdam. Uh, Venice introduces, in April 2018, um, measures to control the access to the cities in order to avoid m too much crowded areas in the city. And we start having articles in the press and the media about top destinations overcrowded. Um, Barcelona comes quite often, Venice comes quite often, Dubrovnik as well. So what we have done in Edit Data, we have made a study that it will be published quite recently. We, we have gone through interviews to those key players in the different destinations because we wanted to know what was going on in that area, so cities, and what kind of actions they have taken in order to benefit from the use of data to measure and reduce the impact of negative, uh, negative impact of tourism. So we have chosen six destinations. Uh, Valencia in the region of Spain, Barcelona, uh, Occitanie in France, Florence in Italy, uh, Western Greece and Amsterdam, which is the only city which is not in the Mediterranean area, but we thought it could be of interest because of uh, the experiences and the best practices that they have implemented. And as a result of this study in these six pilot sites, we came out with um, an overall view of what's going on in terms of use of data to avoid negative impact in tourism. And what we have seen is that there isn't any protocol for action in any of these places that can be implemented all around. That's the main challenge for tourism in the future. There are few implementations of uh, strategies in the cities, 
Valencia, Barcelona, Florence, and Amsterdam. They have implemented few strategies, some common, some different. There are some pilot projects in different regions um, which can be implementing with the use of data, like for example in Barcelona there is a project with La Sagrada Familia in order to monitorize the number of tourists that come to visit this monument. Also Turo de la Rovira um, in Uffizi um, Museum in Florence and in Valencia region for example we have been proactive and we have developed the network of uh, smart tourism destinations because we want to come make come together governance and stakeholders in the tourism industry and trying to uh, learn from best practices. And we have also seen that there are some areas of the pilot projects that have no conflict at the moment. So the conflicts are not that bad. They are not using data, although they know that data will be useful and helpful in some areas for the management of the destination. Um, as a result, there are different uh, preferential areas of action in order to avoid negative impacts of tourism. And we came out with this idea. Basically, when we talk about management in tourism, nowadays we are talking about management of tourism in urban cities, and we need to talk about a triple axis model because everything is related. So any action that we take, for example, in heritage protection, has an impact in the diversification of the offer of the destination. And we, we need to work in three different labels, as we see here. So in the urban system, uh, by urban planning, heritage protection, uh, housing protection for residents, which is one of the main problems that we had suffered in cities like Barcelona, even Valencia nowadays, uh, public space improvement, this means making sure that there are green areas in the city for everyone to enjoy, parking areas that are planned to make the city more um, easy to live in. That relates to the mobility system, so make sure that we have public transport policies and access to the cities or areas of heritage or tur touristic areas, and that also involves tourism management. So how we regulate accommodation, um, how we diversify the offer for tourists, and how we make sure that the experience of the tourists that come to see us don't destroy the soul of the destination. And this goes through different um, strategies. One can be um, trying to offer tourists um, different aspects, trying to this. Um, this is a location of the offer. So avoiding everybody to go at the same period of time during the year. Trying to make attractive low season for the, the uh, specific tourists and so on. So as a result of the study, we've seen that over tourism doesn't happen from one day to another. It's a long process and it gives some kind of indications during this process. There are some, er there are like four different um, periods. One is when we don't have any trouble, there is no conflict at all, we are at the bottom. There is a balance between residential people and tourists visiting the, the destination. There is an incubation period from once we have more tourists coming and we start experiencing few conflicts about accommodation, about the use of the areas, etc. And as we f grow in number of tourism, if we don't manage the situation, we can come with more um, serious problems that need to take action. In order to avoid the fourth uh, phase when we talk about over tourism, which is one of the most um, big problems that some cities have in, in tourism. So I'm going to be quite um, quite quick at the moment. So how can new technologies help us? Uh, obviously, there has been a revolution over the past few years because of the use of media. Now, tourism, they like to travel with their mobile phones. They all go to the same places. They all take the same photos. They are just going 
and doing all the same. And this is a big trouble for destinations because they have to manage these things. With the project, we came out with um, different proposals in order to manage the overtourism situation. So first things we need to know is how big is overtourism. And maybe it's not overtourism, it's overcrowded. We have lots of tourists, what can we do? So first things that we can do with um, data is that they can help us new technologies to know exactly how these tourists are going through the city. And for example, we have an example in Florence where they, by the use of technology, they know exactly which are the circuits that uh, tourism are doing. Another proposal is to plan the capacity of a specific area. This is very important and is in a way quite easy because we have entrance and gates. And in Valencia, for example, we have a project in La Marina, which is in the harbor area in the port that is focused on um, this this proposal and also uh, an application that is being developed by the city of Valencia, which is uh, one of the cities, uh, smart cities. And it has developed this application that is useful for residents. They can have access to mobility information about buses, uh, metro, about activities going on in the city, Depending on your location with your, with your mobile phone, they will inform you about things to do around. And this is something that can be of interest or can be exported or, you know, it can be used in other areas. Also, over tourism zoning is one of the um, strategic actions that a destination can do. And in, in this case, Barcelona has a big experience. They, they were the first to kind of, um, with uh, the special urbanistic plan for tourism accommodation, they regulate the establishment of tourist accommodation in the city. So if you can see the red area is where is more concentration of accommodation, and this gives information and allows to do follow-ups and surveillance. Uh, we also use the new technology in um, in, in Valencia region, for example, we have been proactive because we don't have the trouble of overtourism, but we know that this can be a problem. So we are trying to cooperate with different destinations, trying to create a network for smart tourism destinations in the region, uh, sharing information, best practices, and putting together stakeholders and the uh, government of the regions. One example of um, govern the overtourism is in the beach of ba Benidorm, where we, where we can use Wi-Fi in all the beaches, and it gives lots of data information for the tourism council that can run different strategies. Technology for people, residents, they can benefit from the use of data. Um, they, they can be implemented special programs and plans in the city to avoid ex, an ex, uh, extra volume of tourism. We also learn from best practices. There is a project um, which is called, um, mm, sorry, uh, one, one second. Well, there is a project that has been taking place uh, that gives Leticia probably knows more about it. She'll explain later, I think. Um, urban landscape tourism and experience over tourism. Like all tourists, when they go, they like using the data and the mobile phone. So, for example, Uffizi Gallery has done um, an application where tourists have in real time data about how crowded are different museums and areas to be visited so they can avoid making queues and they can have in real time information to plan their stay in the city and visiting museums. So the project will be, the, the study will be available next week with all the detailed information and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alicia. Now we will have um, Ms. Leticia Ortega. Uh, she will um, talk about 
uh, and her presentation will be from a regional perspective, how metropolitan areas can help to managing over tourism in urban popular destination. She will put the focus on a project called Alter Echo. The floor is yours, Leticia. Okay, thank you. Uh, first thing I would like to uh, say thank you for inviting me to be here to be able to share with these wonderful uh, colleagues uh, the roundtable. And also I would like to thank the organization, the Bled Met Project, and especially the Diputación de Barcelona because of the excellent work they are doing. So before starting to talk about the question uh, they made, uh, I would like to make an experiment with you. So I'm an architect, so I've uh, brought good news, but first I would like you to think about the cities. I would like to propose you an experiment. So I need you to close your eyes and take into account that I'm looking at you. So it's polite if you say, do what I say. Okay, close your eyes and imagine you are living in a sustainable city, okay? Sustainable city that you imagine or one you pick up from the ones we have in Spain, for example, or in the Mediterranean area. So you are living in that city. You are in your home, you are in your bed. It's, uh, let's say, Saturday morning, okay? You are uh, waking up. Um, I need you to be in a good mood, so Saturday morning, it's okay. You wake up, uh, um, you have a rest um, very well. So uh, you decide to open your window to breathe a uh, very good fresh air because it's a sustainable city. And you see that the fruit store, the fruit store is opening. So you think, okay, I'm going to buy something for breakfast. So you decide to, you get dressed and you go to buy your fruit. Uh, don't forget to take a bag. It's a plastic free week, so don't forget the bag, okay? So you take the bag, you go downstairs, okay? It's healthier than the lift, remember? And you go to your fruit store by walk, okay? You walk, you just go there, you see the wonderful fruit, you pick up some, you talk to your uh, uh, fruit seller, you say, okay, how is everything going? You take your fruit, you come back to your home, you find some friend in the way home, and you talk to him and say, okay, let's see this evening in the park, in a bar near the park, for our children to play and just have a beer together to co talk about the week. Okay, so you can open your eyes, okay? I now want to know if you have imagined this city when you open your window or you have imagined more this city. The good thing is that if you have imagined this city, we do not have to reinvent the wheel. It's the cities and the urban planning we already have in the Mediterranean. So, good news, we do not have to reinvent the wheel. So, we just have to preserve what we have and to use the tools that are now as renewable energy to improve the things we already had. But it's nothing new. It's something we know how to do it. The thing is that ha we have to deal with the tourism as an economic source of growth and to find a balance between that and the city we want. So I'm from Alter Eco Project. I'm the coordinator and we have work in the Interreg Met framework to cooperate between different cities. We have Genoa, Dubrovnik, eh, Venice, eh, Malaga, Greek islands, uh, South Asian regions, and my region, Comunidad Valenciana, working together to find this balance, okay? To preserve the Mediterranean city model. We are a testing project, okay? We are not a studying project or a capitalization project. We wanted to test existing best practices in order to help the destinations to start managing sustainable tourism in the city. So, uh, that's why I'm going to expose to you the things we did in order to help these destinations. And I want also to focus on one point. We are a cooperation program, okay? Uh, I agree with Xavier Font, 
that yesterday said that we don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over in the European projects. I totally agree. But on the cooperation programs, it's not nothing that we invent. It's something that we share. To cooperate with others, to see what they are doing, and to be able to help each other, it's really important. That's why cooperation programs need to keep going on the next program periods. So, um, some examples of things we have done. In general terms, for you to uh, focus on what we were trying to do, that's the problem we had, okay? Over tourism, as all of you, this is an example of Valencia, as it's my city, and we had this problem, okay? We have all the tourism in the city center, historical city center, and on the city of arts. And the other areas are not benefiting from the uh, tourism, so uh, what we tried with the different tools we implemented in the different pilots, I will show you uh, in the next minutes, was to move people from the city center and the city of arts to some other neighborhoods that had some attractive uh, monuments and areas and urban planning in order to make them not to have all the pressure in the same places. That's, that was our objective in Valencia, but also in Dubrovnik, in Genoa, or in Venice. So, what we did? We did a lot of different things. We didn't think that uh, we had one solution that was effective for everyone, because everyone has different situations. So, we gave the opportunity to, to, for every destination to analyze their own problems and to propose different solutions. And then we share with each other which were working or which were not working. That also happens. So, we analyze the effects of over tourism. I will put some examples in all of that. We calculated carbon capacity. We monitor the real tourist flows. We made some decision-making tools. We and apply them for planify. We diversify the offer in most of the destinations, and we did also promotional and awareness campaigns. Not all the cities did everything. Some uh, did some of the measures. We pick up different measures from all the steps. So, for example, six examples, and that's all I want to say. In analyzing the effects of over-tourism, similar to the example that Alicia gave for Heritata, in Malaga they did an analysis of the tourism use of the floor, okay? taking into account also the different floors of the buildings. So they uh, saw that they had uh, more than 20% of tourist use in some of the areas of the city. So uh, we established that more than 10% was a dangerous level of tourist use. Why? Because the Mediterranean cities are sustainable because they are compact and they are complex. They have different uses. You can go by walk to your hairdresser. You can go by walk to buy the fruit or to the doctor, or maybe using public transport, no more than 10, 15 minutes uh, away. So if you don't have different uses near you, you are the city is not livable and it's not sustainable. So uh, what Malaga did was to put this limit. So uh, in the city council approved limits on licenses for tourist use in the city center, providing different areas for the ones who want to open a new business on tourism for going to some other area and giving them some benefits to go to these other areas. So we have also, in the case of calculating carbon capacity limit, thanks to the University of Venice, we all were able to calculate our carbon capacity limit. And you will be able also, because we are going to have a free tool on our website during this month, so in Venice, for example, they, with this tool, they realized that the problem was not the total number of tourists they had per day. The problem was the type of tourist. The, the one day visitor was the problem, not the total number of tourists. So we, ca we were able to make decisions based on this data. We also had examples of monitoring the tourist flows 
as uh, we have monitored, for example, the area that uh, Alicia said in Valencia, La Marina, we have put some monitors in order, that's the result, uh, in order to know the exact number of people we have in every place and to know how the different measures were working. Uh, the good thing is, as, uh, for example, we learn from Dubrovnik, Dubrovnik did it in the past, so they advise us on how to do it better. That's cooperation. That allow us to not make the same mistakes they did in the past. And, oh, 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 don't, not so fast. We also created an, uh, decision making tools to make, be able to plan. So uh, this tool will be able in our website uh, during the next month that you are going to be able to calculate your current capacity based on some data as easy as, 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 easy as possible, okay? As we know, it's, it's difficult. And you will be given the level of uh, current capacity that you have in your city, and you will be given tips and advices based on the experience of, of, of our destinations. So depending on your problems, you will select and we will say to you which good practices are better in your case. And we also have diversification of the offer is the main thing we did in many of our destinations. We try to move people from the city center hotspots to other areas. For example, this is the example of Malaga. You have in our table in the exhibition area also the guides for Genoa, the guides for Valencia. We try to make people move. And for example, we also use gamification in order to uh, make people with an app uh, to participate in a, in a contest, to give prizes uh, from local business in order to make them to participate, specifically the millennials that we have been talking to. But we, in Valencia, for example, we had the physical guides and also the app, and we discovered that also the, the guides uh, were, in for some kind of tourists, more successful <laughs> than the app. So it's not that you have to do one thing or the other. Maybe you can combine different strategies to reach different kind of students. And the last measure I wanted to present was uh, that we have also promotional and awareness campaigns. Uh, Alter Eco collaborated in the Respect the City uh, campaign that uh, Dubrovnik has. Uh, providing the point of view of Alter Eco. And also, for example, in Venice also, they try to um, change the behavior of the tourism when they arrive to the airport or the port. And uh, last but not least, for example, in the Valencian community, in my region, we also created an awareness campaign for improving the tourist accommodation, specifically the tourist dwellings, in order to make them better regarding the uh, thermal comfort or accessibility. As we have a very old buildings in on the coast, we need to improve them in order to improve the quality of the offer of accommodation. If we want to have better tourists, we also have to offer better apartments. So uh, that's examples of what we did. So you can check on our website for more information. That's the email if you need any kind of thing. And you have also everything on our table to, uh, that you can take and um, bring home. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Leticia. We have just couple of minutes, um, and so let's wrap up with a couple of questions. I don't think we have time for the, for the hub question, but anyway, I'm sure how our guests will be around for the coffee break. So I don't know if through the hub we have some question, or if you just want to raise your hands and uh, interact with us. Of course, we're in inspiring presentation. We had technical decision, uh, political solution. We talk about governance. We talk about bottom-up approach. And uh, I don't know if through the hub, we have two questions. OK. So I guess with two questions, we, OK. Um, 
what extent the tourist destination can choose the kind of tourists they want to welcome. So how can we choose in the destination uh, the tourists we want? And then the other one is, uh, I can't read from here. Uh, whether can both save your life or drown you? It's a question of balance between the proper quantity and being able to control it. Do you think it's the same for tourist activities? Um, is some, yeah? Okay, Leticia and, and uh, Sergi. Okay. okay. You first, uh, if you want. Just from my point of view, from what I exposed, the first one, uh, just an example. If you want to improve the quality of uh, tourists you have, we had as a pilot um, city, Gandia. Gandia is a city on the coast of Valencia that had a Gandia shore. It was a program of NTV where uh, a lot of young people uh, drank during days and uh, stay in the same home, okay? That makes a really, uh, that make the, mm, that um, the image that Gandia um, had all over the world and all over Spain and all the rest of Europe was that, that you can go there and drink for all over the night. So uh, they needed to change that image, so they had a plan. And they, for example, we did that uh, campaign for improving the tourist accommodation, to make, it them, to make the tourist accommodation better, to be able to have more expensive tourist accommodation, so to have better quality of tourism and not have just cheaper, low-cost tourists of people coming to drink all over the night. So that's just one example of what we did in order to try to help mm -hmm. Gandia. It was Sergi as well. In my opinion, uh, the important point is expectations that you create. Mm -hmm. We live in an information society, so uh, that means we create an expectation about our, our city, and we have to answer of that. But that is the same uh, problem. We have to manage what expectation we create, and we have to manage what, how we answer at this expectation to uh, satisfy the visitor and to satisfy the locals. That is uh, my point of view about, about uh, what kind of tourist. But in the idea of the water that can, can uh, la save or drown, uh, I remember my idea of limits. We, have, we need limits in this uh, about over to we, we need a frame of limits global limit uh, sectorial and, 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 and territorial limits in the space and in the time we need limits but we need tools to get these limits and and uh, and we uh, speak about of, of ma about uh, many of, of these tools you know, manage mobility manage uh, different things but i want to add two big tools that is not easy to to, to speak, high wages and taxes. We need high wages and taxes. Because if it is a trade-off between uh, high wages or, or, or taxes and many, and many more tourism, is that a, a good uh, challenge? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Someone can think that have many slow, uh, many low cost tourists mm. is competitive is, is, a, is a competitive strategy. So we have to, uh, and, and the, the problem is, we we can understand that private sector can have difficulties to accept high wages, mm -hmm. but the, the, the what is uh, strange is many times public sector don't understand that high wages is a sustainable challenge mm -hmm. and taxes too is the same at the end we uh, misstepped uh, uh, Tepsic and Maria will answer we we have just a couple of minutes uh, and then quickly I'm sorry actually I was the one who was keeping 10 minutes time but uh, nevertheless I wanted to to 
tell you that uh, the other day I heard the uh, over tourism can be uh, changed, the expression of a tourism can be changed by a non balanced tourism, which, which is actually very good so from uh, my point of view, since we cannot speak about not having a tourism since it's a base of our economy in Dubrovnik. But uh, uh, about tourist activities, what we can do, and we are already doing, it's using those smart solutions and digital, uh, digital, new digital uh, products and uh, combining with or other kinds of uh, measures and uh, projects. So uh, I don't think Dubrovnik uh, people would agree to not have any tourists mm -hmm. and uh, to limit uh, or to define which type of tourist, it's also not very popular because once when a young person come in Dubrovnik because of Game of Thrones, since we are very popular because of Game of Thrones as well, maybe it will come again with its family in the future period, so it's very difficult to define it. Thank you. Yeah. And then I guess. yeah, very, very briefly. I would like to question this question because, uh, in fact, yes, I guess that if the idea behind the question is to say, how can we select in a city elite and, uh, uh, how can I say, upper tourists who are really able to pay good money and uh, to be very discreet and uh, to not create any buzz, I think that yes, we can. We know that there are some destinations, not that many, but some which charge 2,000 euros as a visa to entry, for example, in a country. But the question behind this is if this is exactly what we want, and if we want, in fact, a more democratic touristic model, in which case this question should be asked differently. Thank you, Maria. Um, 10 seconds answer and then we, we unfortunately because we have in a half an hour coffee break and then we will have another another um, panel okay. just to answer the first question just to answer the first question i think you need to see what are your strengths as destination and you need to be focused on the type of tourists you want to attract to your destination and according to that you you take into account these kind of conditions and you make a marketing plan, you specialize your um, advertisement campaigns or you take key uh, influencers to your destination and you use the power of media to communicate the strengths of the destination and then you can attract people in that segment of tourism that you're interested in. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, for being here. Um, um, we have a coffee break. Please bring with you your, your uh, personal belonging. The, the, the room will be open in half an hour. Well, in 15 minutes, we will have another panel. Thank you very much to our guests that will be around. A big applause for you.